This topic is really just the gift that keeps on giving. Hi, my name is Sydney, welcome back to my channel. As per usual, this video would be nothing if it weren't for our loving sponsor, Surfshark. Now, masculinity is one of those topics that we hear about a lot. And most of the time, the conversation circulates its negative elements. How toxic it is, how it's a gateway drug to violence. I mean, there are full-blown groups of people who actually believe that masculinity in itself is synonymous with, like, violence and war. Blech. But if some people really believe that masculinity is in fact this negative oppressive force in our men and boys, then it makes sense that they'd want to neutralize it. And in the event that they can't do that, destroy it entirely. Which is what I wanna talk about today, the destruction or death of masculinity and the feminization of men. But before we do any of that, let's hear about our sponsor, which you better watch because I try really hard with these ads. What is, what is this? Oh my God, this isn't your new Surfshark ad, is it? As it turns out, you were right. People don't want sex appeal. They want abject pain because life is pain and then gardening and then death. Why are you in pain? Because Lionel, my FBI agent, he can't see what I'm doing online when I use my VPN. It hides my IP address. I think he's stalking other people. Right. Why don't you just turn Surfshark off and then he can start tracking you again? No, because Surfshark also blogs ads and doesn't keep any logs and I can use it on as many devices as I like. And it even has its own private search service. Yeah, I'm really failing to see the problem with this. Don't people also get 84% off and four extra months free when they use code Sydney and click the link in the description? Yes, but I just need to be alone. Hey Sydney, you wanna come over and throw rocks at construction workers while they're carrying heavy things? We're fighting the patriarchy today. Can't you two see I am mourning? Some of you might remember seeing a photo of singer Harry Styles in a dress on the cover of Vogue magazine. A similar photo was also posted by Men's Health and well, that's a whole conversation on its own. Unsurprisingly, the photo went viral, especially after a conservative commentator, Candace Owens, commented on it. She suggested that society cannot survive without strong men, that the steady feminization of men is not a coincidence, but rather an attack, saying that we need to bring back manly men. Now, of course, this sentiment was not shared universally, with many people on the other side of things arguing that dresses don't mark femininity, that men can wear whatever they like, and people shouldn't worry themselves with the things that don't affect them. Ironic, considering how radical leftists just love telling everybody else what to do. Have you guys met you? Seriously. A short time later, Styles posted yet another photo wearing whatever the hell this is, with the caption, bring back manly men. Now, if you're anything like me, then you patently don't care about Harry Styles or literally any other celebrity and what they choose to wear. Seriously, until these people pay my taxes, I'm genuinely not interested in what they do. But if nothing else, this topic has actually raised some valid concerns about the state of men in 2020 and the overall all feminization of traditional masculinity. Depending on who you ask, the feminization of men is either harmful, weakening our society, or suppressing innate biological tendencies, or it's successfully uncovering and rooting out toxic traits in men and manhood. It's either a significant negative problem or a welcome byproduct of blurring gender roles and stereotypes. Such in the case of Harry Styles. Or Gucci's attempt at releasing a tartan dress with a satin bow for men in the hopes of disrupting the toxic stereotypes that mold masculine gender identity. Well, they're certainly disrupting something. This is the face of, apparently you can pay me an enough to wear this. But there really are people out there who believe that it is necessary to wear skirts and heels in order to challenge gender norms. And this is just one cosmetic example of the push to change these traits in men. So when we talk about this, it entirely depends upon which side of the fence you stand. Do you want a society where the lines of gender are blurred, where there is no clear distinction between men and women, socially, emotionally, developmentally, and externally, or do you want a society where men and women have clearly defined roles, determined by their innate immutable characteristics as two separate sexes, 
and of course with a little added nuance to suit the date and time period. Well, I certainly know where I stand. It's the second option, in case that wasn't clear, because I don't want this. No, thank you. I'll be fine. The feminization of men, at least in my opinion, has been in progress for several decades. If it helps, think about it as like He-Man versus like this. In 1976, a sociologist called Robert Bannon wrote a book called The 49% Majority, where he detailed the blueprint of manhood, describing core tenets of masculinity at the time. These included things like not showing weakness or acting feminine, striving for financial success and social status, projecting an aura of confidence and self-reliance, being the strong silent type, and striving to be tough, adventurous, and live life on the edge. By 2020 standards, it's very clear that many of these traits would simply not be valued in the same way that they used to be. Nowadays, several of these things would be considered toxic masculinity, especially anything and everything relating to suppressing emotion or not wanting to act feminine, which like, I guess leftists want men to do for some reason. I just want you to cut me down a tree and build me a house. This isn't hard. Some research actually confirms this, telling us that young men themselves value intellectual strength over physical strength. They value openness and altruism more than they value autonomy. Although if you ask me, I'd argue that men have always valued altruism. Just ask the men on the Titanic as they gurgled to the bottom of the ocean. One article I read suggested that this change to masculinity isn't necessarily a bad thing. It doesn't signal the death of the cowboy, but rather the death of the gunslinger. The cowboy just got more sophisticated to fit in with our shifting world of office jobs and nerds. This idea might even help explain the decline in physical dominance in men, such as dropping testosterone levels and overall physical strength, which has been documented in a few studies relating to endurance and grip strength. One study, for example, basically concluded that the average college male has no more hand strength than a 30-year-old mom. In saying that, we know there's at least one thing you guys are good at gripping. My hand, when you take me on a nice date. Get your heads out of the gutter. Now, I'm not saying for a second that men have to abide by and fit into this 1970s version of masculinity. But society overall appears much more comfortable with the softer emotional man than the cut me down a tree and build me a fortress kind of man. The problem arises when men do actually have these traditional characteristics. They are increasingly unable to express them or act them out, lest they be labeled toxic or fragile and cast to the back of the proverbial gender bus. In early 2019, the American Psychological Association issued its first ever guidelines for practice with men and boys. Its primary message claimed that traditional masculinity, such as stoicism, competitiveness, dominance, and aggression, is, on the whole, harmful. And honestly, these characteristics are now genuinely viewed as toxic masculinity across the board. And this is viewed as the path to violence and sexual harassment, and traditional masculinity is the gateway to get there. With this intense scrutiny on men all the time, even for innocuous behavior, it's really no wonder that men would want to separate and distance themselves from traditional manhood. The feminist movement has, without question, had an enormous hand in this. Over the last several decades, the purpose of women has been expanded dramatically. Rather than raising children predominantly, women can effectively do anything a man can do. Except create sperm, but I'm sure that science is working on that one. Feminism even the playing field in almost all areas. Women can have sex like men, earn money like men, dress like men, and despite what feminist literature might tell you about equality, women have never been more equal. The problem is that nobody has really attempted to expand the purpose of men and uplift them in the same way. And why would they? What allegedly started off as a movement for equality, which it isn't, instead has become laser focused on the patriarchy and eliminating inherent flaws in our male oriented society and its effect on women. Even the push to break down traits of traditional masculinity, such as independence, dominance, and suppression of emotion, has never really been about helping men themselves, but rather helping men help women. As aptly demonstrated by the UN and its tweet on International Men's Day this year. Just stop that. Even when people do point to ameliorating significant issues with men, such as the prevalence of male suicide rates, 
homelessness, divorce, loneliness, and so on, it's framed not as, hey, let's build up men, but rather let's eliminate their harmful behavior. What's even more interesting is that the same masculine traits society seems to want to eliminate in men seem to be the same ones we celebrate in women. That sense of drive, purposefulness, aggression, and leadership, just to name a few examples. So I guess here we are, where the lines between the sexes are blurred, the roles are unclear, and while some people celebrate these things as positive steps towards equality and progressivism, it's clear that many men simply don't know where they fit in anymore, or how they should behave in a world that has practically replaced them with, like, vibrators and turkey basters and... Stop being graphic. I do what I want. You're not the boss of me. But maybe it's shaming men and denying them their masculinity that's leading to negative behavior. In 2005, Rob Willer, a sociology doctoral candidate at Cornell University, presented findings that men act more masculine when their masculinity is under threat. In his own words, the men reported feeling more ashamed, guilty, upset, and hostile when their masculinity was threatened, leading them to express greater support for the Iraq war at the time and show a greater tendency towards homophobia, for example. This is something I find really interesting because it seems like we've created a world where men are constantly under attack, where their manhood is constantly being questioned, and there's a significant confusion over their role in society. We know from research that men presently feel confusion in their interactions with the opposite sex, which has only been heightened by movements like Me Too and Believe Women. In some studies, over 40% of men say that they are worried about navigating social interactions with women, from greeting them with a kiss hello to opening a door for them, things which, in days gone by, were a sign of respect and chivalrousness, that today are viewed in some circles as sexist and overbearing. The attack on what many of us would consider traditional masculinity might be hard to picture on the surface. Some of it seems fairly deliberate, whereas other components feel like an unfortunate byproduct of our shifting society. Society. As of 2020, there are more single-parent-headed households than any other time in recent history, 80% of which are headed by mothers. Almost a quarter of all children live with a single mother, a 12% increase from 1968. In 2015, Dr. Warren Farrell gave a TED Talk about what he calls the boy crisis. He talked a lot about fatherlessness and its effects on young men. Fatherlessness, as we've discussed on this channel before, has extremely negative consequences on young boys, such as alcoholism and crime. And we see that in the data also. So for example, before age nine, girls and boys committed suicide equally. Age 10 to 14, twice the amount for boys. 15 to 19, four times the amount. Age 20 to 24, six times the amount for boys. So if dad deprived boys is the number one cause of the boy crisis. And let's not forget, even in the cases where fathers are actually around but experiencing relationship breakdown, child custody is often awarded to the mother, which leads me to ask just how valued fatherhood is anyway, and how that makes men feel about another role that's been ripped out from under them. Seriously, we all know what happened to Jim in Treasure Planet when his father left. It's like the saddest montage I've ever seen in my life. Disney. Why? In Pharrell's talk, he also points out how boys go from a father or male-deprived home environment to a male-deprived school environment, and this also has negative consequences. In recent years, we've come to find out that the education model most often presented to students better suits the learning styles of girls. In addition to that, some 77% of all American teachers and nearly 90% of American primary school or elementary school teachers are women. There is a significant gap between what boys find stimulating and engaging and what the female-orientated education system deems appropriate. Which is why some researchers have concluded that boys and young men are simply being left behind, because the feminized education system isn't built to deal with them. As Pharrell explains, the United Nations did a worldwide study and found that boys were often graded higher on a reading test when the teacher did not know that the person who took the test was a boy. Similarly, he also points out that boys do better overall when their teachers are also male. This is for several reasons, some of which are because male teachers challenge boys to work harder and have an impact on boosting their confidence in their own abilities, 
Or maybe it's because boys like having a stable male role model. So boys effectively go from a feminized home environment to a feminized education system. Then some of them go on to work in an increasingly feminized workplace, where they are fearful of interacting with women, where they're told to eliminate masculine language from their speech, to feminized marriages where women wield the majority of power, control their money, and allow them to have a man cave because she doesn't like that ugly table that you bought in 2009. She's not wrong. It really is gross and you should probably throw it away. Bet there's a bunch of men out there who are laughing themselves all the way to the bank with their Pokemon cards that their wife tried to throw out that are now worth a lot of money. In saying all of this, maybe the problem is not the toxicity of masculinity or too much masculinity, but the complete lack of it. When I initially started writing this video, I looked heavily at feminizing men through humiliation and shame through making them dress effeminately or making them feel like women, so to speak, as two primary focuses. I mean, what better way to humiliate them than literally giving everything they do a stupid flim flam name? Manterrupt, manspread, mansplain, man cook. I made that last one up, that one doesn't exist. Which I guess is fine, because neither do the rest of them. Now, while nobody is actually forcing men to wear dresses, like in the cases I've already mentioned, poor Harry Styles, it appears that the idea is becoming more mainstream. A quick Google search turns up plenty of articles about the topic, anecdotes from parents and celebrities parading around their boys. I even found a series of mothers who'd put their sons in dresses to support a television series and book about a boy discovering cross-dressing and drag. A video, mind you, that BBC One tried to hide, but I see you. I see everything. The thing is, clothes have an impact on how people feel and behave, something that has been documented in many situations over many decades. In 2012, one pair of researchers coined the term enclothed cognition and attempted to further prove that clothes have a profound psychological and behavioral consequence for wearers. In the case of boys and men, there is a relationship between clothing, shame, and humiliation. And uh, additionally, but probably not unsurprisingly, the management of masculinity through forcing men to wear feminine clothing is not a new idea. In the 1970s, researchers carried out what they called the Stanford Prison Experiment. During the experiment, prisoners were given a dress or smock and not allowed to wear any underclothes. The study team noted that while they realize men in prison don't actually wear dresses, real male prisoners do feel humiliated and do feel emasculated. Their goal was to produce similar effects quickly by putting men in a dress without any underclothes. Indeed, as soon as some of their prisoners were put in these uniforms, they began to walk and sit differently, to hold themselves differently, more like a woman than a man. What's interesting is that this has been documented before. In the Victorian era, sometimes young boys were forced to wear feminine clothes in an effort to fix their unwanted behavior, in a practice known as petticoating or petticoat discipline. This is not to be confused with breaching, where toddler boys for like hundreds of years wore dresses because it was easier to change their diapers and so on, but were eventually transitioned into pants and it was like celebrated because, I don't know, I guess yay pants. Pity coding, on the other hand, worked by humiliating and embarrassing the boys so much that he was careful not to engage in any kind of activity that would draw attention to himself, thus making him easier to control in public. Obviously, I'm not precisely sure how common pity coding was because, as well as being like a weird practice, it's also a fetish? Because of course it is. So uh, when I Google it, I just get to see a lot of this. Early accounts that actually reference petty coding, despite how much research and reading I did, are reasonably scant as well, making it kind of hard to determine just how common it was. And regrettably, this just isn't a hill I'm willing to die on. As of 2020, and again unsurprisingly, there are plenty of accounts of this, both as a punishment and a fetish and a punishment, that's a fetish. There are also plenty of news articles where parents or teachers made young boys wear makeup and dresses to humiliate them, and those weren't particularly difficult to find. I had to look at a lot of weird crap for you guys. 
I'm not even gonna lie. The funny thing is, what I'm describing to you is precisely what people on the other side of things are trying to fight against. They want this line between male and female clothing completely obliterated in order to disrupt gender norms. But logically, there has to be a reason why men find dressing effeminately to be such an affront. And a good female friend of mine made a good point about this that I think is worth repeating. When a woman wears dresses as her main item of clothing, for example, she's considered very feminine or very girly. Dresses, for whatever reason, are a symbol of super femininity. Same with high heels. In fact, studies have gone on to show that wearing high heels helps people distinguish men from women when all they have to go off is a silhouette. Wearing jeans and a shirt, by my estimation, is gender neutral clothing. Men wearing a suit and tie is masculine. Women wearing dresses is feminine. For whatever reason, which is kind of inexplicable to me, this is the meaning that we assign to these specific things. That's just my two cents. Anyway, humiliating, emasculating, and feminizing men goes well beyond clothing. It has been used since forever as a means of control during war, especially in the form of sexual abuse. This humiliation usually neutralizes men and makes them completely unable to rise up and fight back, as described in several cases, such as in the Democratic Republic of Congo and Abu Ghraib, for example. One study quoted male victims, saying that if a man in prison says that he is made to feel like a woman, this is commonly understood to mean that he was degraded, dehumanized, and sexualized. I'm just gonna add here too that many of the papers I read in relation to this topic somehow managed to link the way that men were feeling to misogyny and homophobia. As in, if a man is feeling worthless because he's been sexually abused, somehow that fits into a larger commentary about sexism and homosexuality. Which is honestly just, like, exhausting, and goes to my earlier point about how helping men is never actually really about helping men. I'm just... Stop this. Now, again, I realize that what I am talking about, what I am describing here, is precisely what people on the left want to change. But their methods don't revolve around building men up and supporting them, but rather criticizing them for characteristics that they naturally have. There are also plenty of other areas that we could have explored in this video relating to this phenomenon, such as the feminization of the military, the feminization of the police force, and any really other male-dominated environment. How we have changed our language, how we talk about straight white men as this, like, really overbearing negative force in society, and so on. But this video is just clearly long enough as it is, so, you know, another time. Now, in saying everything that I've said, I want to be clear that there is actually nothing wrong with being a man who is not the perfect picture of traditional masculinity. Not everyone can be he-man, and that's okay. However, shaming men who do fit this mold, whether that be entirely or partly, is having, in my opinion, entirely detrimental effects on society as a whole. Unequivocally, there is a significant value in strong masculine men. These are builders, leaders, protectors, soldiers in our society who complement women and make up for the things that we simply can't do. And there's nothing wrong with that. There never has been. At the end of the day, attempting to destroy the characteristics that underpin masculinity has not helped us. Rather, if we're being honest, it's hindered us. Replacing masculine influence with this much feminine influence will never result in balancing out society. We need masculine men. We need the gunslinger. And shaming them and feminizing them out of existence has certainly not helped us so far, and it absolutely won't help us in the future. Now, before I open the floor to all of you, this is just a reminder that you can download Surfshark VPN using the link in the description. When you do, you'll receive 84% off and four extra months free. Now, I open the floor to all of you. What do you all think? Is Harry Styles wearing a dress actually a problem? Is this something we should care about? Is masculinity actually under threat? Are men being feminized? Do you think that this entire thing has been blown way out of proportion? And what do you generally make of this issue overall? As always, if you like the video, hit subscribe and the thumbs up button. If you want to leave a comment for free to do so, just be respectful about it. And I will see you guys next time.